The counterpart to coupling via cables is coupling via the product enclosure. Here the fields interact directly with the conducting structures inside the enclosure, wires, PCB tracks and even the components themselves. The extent of the interaction is determined by the geometry and size of the conductors, with long or widely separated tracks and wires coupling greater amounts of energy into or out of the system. A shielded enclosure reduces this interaction, but no shield is perfect, and gaps or apertures in the conductive surface of the shield will allow fields to penetrate in both directions, coupling with the whole of the contents of the enclosure, but particularly with structures close to the gap. Enclosures coupling, enclosure coupling, predominates at frequencies whose wavelengths are comparable to the enclosure's dimensions and ne necessitates radiated as well as conducted testing. Electrical fast transient bursts test subjects. Uh, the electrical fast transient burst test subjects, the EUT, to bursts of transient that test its immunity to environmental disturbances caused mainly by local power switching operations. The transients are called fast to distinguish them from lower frequency surges caused by distant disturbances outside the immediate environment. When a current carrying circuit is interrupted by an unsuppressed air gap switch, such as a contactor or relay, the resultant voltage rise across the gap causes a repetitive ignition and extinction of an arc discharge, the so-called showering arc effect. The nature of the arc is determined by the magnitude of interruption current the circuit and load inductance and stray capacitance and the rate of separation of the contact. It generally results in a burst of fast, low energy current transients which couple along the supply circuit or are radiated from the conductors on either side of the switch. The burst repetition rate varies from 10 kHz to 1 MHz. The supply wiring appears as a transmission line so that the line characteristic impedance determines the transient source impedance and the transients themselves are easily attenuated by distance. As a result, these fast switching transients are only a threat to local susceptible equipment, but the digital equipment in particular may easily be upset by them. The surge test applies high energy but relatively low bandwidth transients, particularly representing those that may be attributable to nearby lightning strikes. Lightning can couple to power and other external lines in any of three generic ways. Direct, by a strike to an overhead or exposed line, indirect via, couple, by, via ground coupling, lightning strikes the ground causing a transient potential gradient which is applied to cables that are ground referenced, or indirect from cloud to cloud strikes, magnetic and electric fields induce surges in cables on or near the ground. The duration of a typical direct strike which creates both electric or E fields and magnetic or H fields as well as current and voltage surges is in the order of tens of microseconds with an initial rise time of a microsecond or so. The peak channel current is measured in tens or hundreds of kiloamps. So a direct strike could be 100,000 amps with a one microsecond rise time. For indirect strike this is usually a lot lower, typically about 80 volts peak to peak. The ESD immunity test is intended to simulate the threat from a nearby or direct discharge from a charged person. It does not represent other sources such as furniture or vehicles, which are also a common source of ESD. When movement occurs between two surfaces, the triboelectric effect causes a separation of charge between them, and this in turn causes an electric potential to build up on each surface, and by extension on the body beneath that surface. This charge will then be equalised when the body approaches and touches another object, whether or not it is grounded. If the object is electronic apparatus, the resulting discharge current can cause malfunction in the apparatus and even damage to sensitive electronic components. The severity level offered in testing of IEC 61000-4-2 represent four categories of environment, depending on their likely minimum relative humidity and the presence or absence of static generative materials. We have level one, which is a 35% minimum relative humidity, with anti-static control and a 2 kV contact to air discharge, going right up to level 4, which is 10% relative humidity, synthetic rich environment, 8 kV contact and 15 kV air discharge. Low frequency power supply compatibility is also regarded as an EMC phenomenon, 
Disturbances of the supply voltage itself, sometimes known as power quality or PQ, are of course varied. The standard test simply specifies some standard dips and interruptions on the main supply in order to give repeatable and universal testing. Dips and interruptions are abrupt changes. The standard also offers an optional test against voltage variations with a defined transition period, but these are rarely used by product committees. The voltage dips interrupts test is applied to the main supply input and usually uses a programmable waveform generator. It may also use a switched variac on the local mains if the supply has sufficient capability. The basic parameters are interruptions to 0% voltage from half a cycle to 50 cycles. So that would be a dip down to zero volts for between one half of a power cycle, so one half of a 50th of a second, right up to one second, 50 cycles of the power. And dips to four, from 40 to 70% of the nominal voltage from half a cycle to 50 cycles again. So that's dipping down to 40% of the normal power supply or 70% of the power supply. Testing with a steady magnetic field may apply to all types of equipment intended for mains distribution networks or for electrical installations. Testing with a short duration magnetic field related to fault conditions requires higher test levels than those for steady state conditions. The highest values apply mainly to equipment to be installed in exposed areas of electrical plants. Magnetic fields at power frequencies are common in the environment but are only a threat to certain types of equipment. The commercial magnetic field immunity test method requires the UT to be get your words out. The commercial magnetic field immunity test method requires the EUT to be immersed in a magnetic field of 50 Hz or 60 Hz sinusoidal generated by an induction loop surrounding it in three orthogonal orientations. By contrast, the military magnetic field immunity test of DEFSTAN 5941 or 411 DRS01 applies a spot field from a small loop located close, 5 cm, to the EUT, over the range 20 Hz to 50 kHz. The levels of typically 140 dB picoteslas, which equates to 10 microteslas, or 8 amps per meter up to 4 kHz, applied in this test have been derived from extensive measurements taken within the confines of ships, aircraft, and military land vehicles. Coupling mechanisms. Putting source and victim together shows the potential interference routes that exist from one to the other. These can be identified as one, conducted through a direct connection from one to the other, two, near field induced by proximity of structures such as cables which have significant mutual capacitance or inductance, or three, far field radiated where the structures behave as receiving or transmitting antennas. When systems are being built, it is necessary to know the emission signature and susceptibility of the component equipment to determine whether problems are likely to be experienced with close coupling. Adherence to published emission and immunity standards does not guarantee freedom from system EMC problems, but the IEC standard IEC 61000-5-2 is a helpful source of guidance on mitigation techniques and in, in installations. In practical situations, intrasystem and external coupling between equipment is modified by the presence of screening and dielectric materials, and by the layout and proximity of interfering and victim equipment, and especially their respective cables. Ground or screening planes may enhance an interference signal by reflection, or attenuate it by absorption. Cable-to-cable -cable coupling can be either capacitive or inductive, and depends on orientation, length, and proximity to other materials. Dielectric materials may also reduce the field by absorption. Each component has a complex frequency dependent behavior and may include or introduce harmonic and intermodulation components due to non sinusoidal waveforms and non linearities. So, before we go into some heavier stuff, let's have a look at a typical EMC problem from a commercial aspect. A major manufacturer of automotive parts commissioned a series of robotic paint booths. Paint booths? paint booths. To save cost, it was agreed that the cabling would be installed by contractors. So this is a large piece of equipment with both movement and solvent spraying. From a safety point of view, we don't want the robot moving when it shouldn't be, and we also don't want it spraying solvent when it shouldn't be. The paint booths suffered random and sometimes dangerous faults, 
80% of the shielded cables had to be replaced, this time using correct shield termination. But after an EMC investigation, 80% of the shielded cables needed replacing. The supplier had not provided any instructions on the correct termination of the screened cables, so after protracted legal arguments, he picked up the bill for the modification and also had to pay the penalty clauses in the contract. So that's just a very basic example of a typical EMC issue in the commercial environment. So let's take a look at some EMC control measures. EMC control can be applied at three levels, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Control at the primary level involves circuit design measures such as decoupling, balanced configurations, bandwidth, and speed limitations, and also board layer and grounding. For some low performance circuits, and especially those which have no con connecting cables, such measures may be sufficient in themselves. At the secondary level, the interference between the internal circuitry and external cables is invariably a major route for interference in both directions, and for some products, particularly where the circuit design has been frozen, all the control may have to be applied by filtering at these interfaces. Choice and mounting of connectors forms an important part of this exercise. Full shielding, the tertiary level, is an expensive choice to make and should only be chosen when all other measures have been applied. But since it is difficult to predict the effectiveness of primary measures in advance, it is wise to allow for the possibility of being forced to shield the enclosure. At the system or installation level, further measures can be taken. These include cable routing and segregation, as well as the implementation of system-wide grounding and bonding. An example of layered EMC mitigation using shielding and filtering. So we have a cable going into an equipment rack enclosure. We have filtering on the cable and shielding provided by the rack cabinet enclosure. We then have the chassis of the rack unit. The cable passes into this through a second filter and also the chassis itself will provide shielding. And finally we have the circuit itself with filtering again on the cable and a shielded enclosure around it. Cutting holes in enclosures. A single shielded filtered enclosure could easily achieve suppression of 80 dBs at 900 MHz and is an easy item to purchase from numerous suppliers. But cutting a single hole just 15 mm in diameter, e.g. to add an indicator lamp, would reduce it to 20 dBs at 900 MHz. So the initial container can provide strong shielding. However, shielding is very easily compromised by cutting holes in it to run cables, pipes, lamps, and other items through the enclosure outer skin. Further compromise can be caused by incorrect termination of cables, even through an EMC gland if not utilized correctly. 